Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> I would like to tell you a story about a brilliant coin engraver working at the Mint of Constantinople, who, 1,053 years ago, found himself facing a formidable challenge. The seven-year reign of the Emperor John I Zimiscus, which began in December 969 AD, was not particularly noteworthy. But he did do something that means that we are talking about him here today. He instructed his mint at Constantinople to depict the face of Christ on his bronze circulating coins instead of using his own portrait. And a recent acquisition may have prompted the emperor's decision because 25 years earlier, Constantinople had acquired the holiest relic in Christendom, the image of Edessa or the Mandelion. And this mysterious cloth was said to have been entrusted to the same keeping of King Agbar in the first century AD by the disciples of Jesus. And it was said to bear a supernatural image of Christ, not made by human hands. And a contemporary account describes the image as being, quote, a moist secretion with no paint or artistic craft, transferred with no artistic intervention onto the cloth, which sounds vaguely familiar. But recovering the relic from a Muslim occupied Edessa was a great accomplishment which prompted huge rejoicing throughout the empire. And was the decision, I wonder, to depict Christ on their circulating bronze follies intended to commemorate this event and celebrate throughout the Byzantine Empire that the Holy Mandelion was safe in the hands of their Christian emperor? Now, although the cloth was considered too holy to go on public display at the time, I can only imagine that the emperor wanted to make sure that a good likeness of the true face of Christ appeared on his coins. So I imagine that our humble coin engraver would have been granted a special viewing of the man living so that he could reproduce an accurate likeness of the holy face. And this was to be the first time that Christ had been depicted on a mass-produced circulating coin for the common people. And to make the coin, the engraver would carve his design directly onto a metal die made from hardened bronze or iron. A metal disc would then be heated to make it soft and then placed between the two dies before being struck sharply with a hammer to transfer the design onto the coin. Now, given the large number of circulating coins required for the empire, our humble engraver would not have had the luxury of spending many hours carefully crafting an elaborate and intricate design of the kind used for the prestigious gold coins. Those gold coins were struck in very small numbers and only for the wealthiest in society. So the design for the circulating bronze coin had to be small. And I actually have it here. Um, had to be very small. Um, it, it had to basically be very simple and easy to reproduce on multiple dies so that the mint could mass produce the coins more efficiently. Um, the actual image itself of Christ that appears on this coin is no more than a centimetre in diameter. And of course it had to look like the face of Christ in order to please the emperor and everyone else who had the privilege of viewing the Mandelion. So, what did our engraver do? Can we go through? That's right, so that's the point, and then if you move on to the next slide, this is the coin I'm holding in my hand. Now we can see that what was actually engraved onto the die by flipping the image, in other words, what appears on the coin is effectively a mirror image of the die that struck it. So the engraver engraves into the die, that die is then used to, to, to punch into the actual coin. And so what we're left with, of course, is a mirror image. So if we flip the image that actually appears on the coin, we have what's behind you now. And when we reverse the image, we can see that our engraver took a very novel approach. He appears to have carefully copied the faint lines that make up the image on the holy cloth. And let me, let me show you. So we have a distinctive cross shape incorporating the eyebrows, the forehead, and the nose. We also have, the next slide, a, a small square underneath the moustache. We also see evidence of an injury to the cheek that appears on both the holy cloth and also on our little engraved, on our engraved coin. We see a forked beard. And we see two distinct strands of hair running in parallel on the left-hand side of the cloth. Now that's an awful lot of similarities to fit into an image that is no more than one centimeter in diameter. I think our coin designer did a phenomenal job. And surrounding the face are inscribed in Byzantine Greek the words, God with us, 
and on the reverse is the inscription, Jesus Christ, King of Kings. Now, the tradition of depicting Christ on the cloth, uh, oh, sorry, on a bronze circulating coin of the Byzantine Empire, lasted for 123 years. And they are known collectively as the anonymous Hollis because they did not carry the details of the emperors who struck them. But by faithfully copying the lines that make up the facial image on the Holy Mandilion, a Byzantine engraver has provided us with compelling physical evidence that the mysterious image that he saw in Constantinople in 969 AD is what we call the Shrine of Turin today. The coins would have circulated for many decades throughout the empire, and it means, unfortunately, that surviving examples are often very badly worn, particularly around the more important facial areas, which would have been the most prominent, of course, on the plot on the coin. But when we do find a good example, it is often possible to find multiple points of similarity with the face of the man on the shroud. Now, I have another very good example of an anonymous policy in my collection, and this coin was struck about 60 years later, during the reign of, of either Romanus III or Michael IV, between 1028 and 1041 AD. And it's larger than the earlier coin, but the bronze policy had been increased in size by that time. And this would have given our engraver a little more opportunity to incorporate more detail into the show, into the image. And again, we can see some startling similarities between the coin and the image on the shroud. Let's have a look at them. So we have, um, very interestingly, uh, if you could move on to the next one, that's lovely. We, we can see an inverted three shape in the middle of the forehead, exactly where we see a similarly shaped bloodstone on the shroud. It's very small, but it is there, you can see it. Uh, we also see uh, long hair that is bunched at the shoulders, and we see a moustache that appears to be sloping down on the left side, again, exactly as we see on the shroud. And very interestingly, I, I think we also see a horizontal band across the throat, both on, the, on this little coin and also on the, on the image on the shroud. And I would suggest, therefore, that these similarities are simply too many and too specific to be a coincidence. And so these two little coins alone, I think, provide us with absolutely compelling numismatic evidence that the mint engravers working in Constantinople in the 10th and the 11th centuries carefully studied and studiously copied the face that appears on the Shroud of Amazing. Any questions? Yes, they will. Oh, I just, just keep in and the camera. Thank you. It's a fascinating presentation and so focused. I appreciate that. The, um, my question is the comparison of the image on the coins to the faces that might be seen on other coins, other polis, if that's the right plural, of the era. Is there, is there a great difference between that image and other images on other coins? Uh, no, the, 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 as I said, the, the, the challenge is to actually find an anonymous polis that actually has all of the details still on it. Because as I said, these coins would have been in people's pockets, they would have been used for decades all around the Byzantine Empire. And so unfortunately, the examples that we have surviving to this day are very often quite bad and good. And as I said, unfortunately, the facial detail is the first thing to go, because that would be the most prominent part. So as it was rolled and picked out of people's purses and wallets, it would have obviously eventually sort of, uh, those designs would have rubbed off. So, so if you can find a good example of an anonymous well, it's very often, they are, uh, you know, they have tremendous sort of points of detail. They carry on making the anonymous follies, by the way, for about 130 years. So obviously, over time, different engravers would take different approaches. Some engravers attempted to actually create a, a more, if you like, generic bearded man, uh, bearded figure to, to actually put onto the coins. What I particularly like about the small one, this is the one that actually features in the David T documentary, um, what I particularly like about this one is that the, the coin engraver appears to have just copied the lines. He didn't have time to, to make a, a detailed image of the face and we're all grateful for it because what he did was basically copied the lines that he could actually see on the Holy Mandilion and because of, the, and because of that he's created something which is absolutely unmistakable. I think, as the face of, uh, of Christ as it appears on the Shroud of Turin. And I think this 
like, like all the other evidence that we have, absolutely blows the colour and makes you question out of the water, because there's no doubt in my mind at all that our engraver in the 10th century saw the image that we call the Sherman Tomb today. Thank you.